Kicking off at number five, the McPherson tape, 1998. Kurt, Kurt, they're on the roof. Kurt, what are we gonna do, man? We're on the roof. Oh. Also known as Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County, the McPherson tape is an incredible display of science fiction horror done well, in a time when the found footage subgenre was just finding its feet. I'll be honest with you guys, when I first saw the McPherson tape as a kid, when it was broadcast as a straight to TV film, I thought it was actually real. And I wasn't alone either, because when it originally aired on UPN on January 18th, 1998, hundreds of people called in to verify that it wasn't actually portraying real life events. So much so that the Lake County Sheriff's Department had to release a statement reassuring viewers that the events didn't take place. The McPherson tape centers around a family of the same name who have gathered together for Thanksgiving at their lake house when things quickly and mysteriously go wrong. As usual, I don't want to spoil any plot points for this film because it's definitely worth a watch, but if you're terrified of the thought of little green men roaming around your house at night, then you'll definitely be a fan of this film. Coming in at number four, The House is October Built, 2014. And yeah, this film is great fun and so damn creepy for the most part. Directed by Bobby Rowe alongside hit producer Steven Schneider, the man behind the original Paranormal Activity, Insidious and The Devil Inside, The House's October Built is a fantastic spin on the fan photo genre and features some genuinely terrifying set pieces throughout. It gives you that weird sense of dread that the subgenre tries so wholeheartedly to capture, but this film does it to perfection in parts. The House's October Built focuses on a group of friends, all horror fans, May I add, traveling throughout southern USA in the lead up to Halloween. They've got an obsession with live action haunted house attractions and the film plays out as a kind of mini road trip, ramping up the fake scares as it plays out. But while well, the fake scares quickly turn into real scares and the second half of the movie really manages to turn up the heat. The strength of this film is how personal it feels. There's no wider scope other than the events that unfold before us and it's backed up by a genuinely believable cast and likeable characters, which makes the ending that much more bleak. Give it a watch. Next up at number three, Noroi, The Curse, 2005. Now, this is for sure an interesting film, to say the least, and it's a welcome sore thumb in the world of Japanese horror. It comes from renowned director Koji Shirashi, who's made quite the name for himself as a fan footage auteur, with films like Occult and Shirome, a departure from the short and settling style often found in J-horror. Naroi is perhaps the best example of his work, and it stands out as a slow-burning mockumentary of paranormal investigation in Japan. Naroi features an absolutely mammoth task, interweaving several storylines that lead up to a deeply disturbing ending. For the most part though, it focuses on Masafumi Kobayashi, a paranormal expert famous for uncovering supernatural mysteries and his investigation of a strange woman and her young son. It manages to give us just enough to keep the mystery going, and I don't say this lightly, pretty much every scene is unsettling as we quickly realise that there are much more malevolent powers at play. Swinging in at number two, The Blair Witch Project, 1999. And you just knew this one would make this list, didn't you? Of course, perhaps the most famous found footage horror film of all time, and many people's first horrific dive into the subgenre. The Blair Witch Project is an awesome horror film, I'm gonna say it, and the impact that it had on the genre as a whole can't be denied. The reason that The Blair Witch Project is so damn good is because it managed to pull off exactly what terrifies us, a stark reminder that what really scares us is the stuff that we can't see, especially in a time when horror cinema was trying its hardest to deliver full frontal fear. Again, like with the McPherson tape, the Blair Witch Project relied heavily on viral marketing. Even a year after its release, the three actors, Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard and Michael C. Williams, were listed on their IMDb pages as missing or deceased. The film's creators, Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez, made huge strides in creating a working mythology for the film, drawing on 18th century folk legends to fabricate their own occultist backdrop, hinting to the viewer that perhaps Perhaps there was some truth to the events of the film. In essence, it's what makes found footage horror so good when it's done well. An uneasy mix between horror fiction and horror fact. And finally, our number one spot, The Borderlands 2013. All 
also known as Final Prayer in the US, but come on, the original title is so much better. The Borderlands is a 2013 British horror film written and directed by Elliot Goldner in his directorial debut. I'm going to say it, this film is awesome for many reasons, but the main reason is that it answers a question that somewhat mires the believability of found footage horror. Why are they still filming? Well, The Borderlands has a pretty decent answer for that. Three men who were sent by the Vatican to provide evidence of demonic occurrences in a remote church in rural Britain. I really, really don't want to spoil anything in this film because I sincerely urge you to watch it if you haven't. But, but in my opinion, this is one of the best found footage horror films of recent times. It's equal parts The Wicker Man and equal parts The Exorcist, and it's an awesome display of British folk horror, an emerging subgenre that is really hitting the mark for this particular horror fan. Really, guys, I can't say much more other than just watch this one because it's really, really good. Number five, Grave Encounters. Now you guys had a lot to say about this particular film in the first part of this series and rightly so because put it this way if every episode of Most Haunted was as awesome as this then we'd have enough content to keep us going for the next few decades. Written and directed by the Vicious Brothers aka Colin Minahan and Stuart Ortiz, Grave Encounters is a 2011 Canadian supernatural horror film that strikes at the vein of paranormal reality TV. Which as I mentioned previously is a much needed antidote to the fan footage genre as a whole. We as an audience need to be able to suspend our disbelief when faced with such a personal depiction of horror. Again, it strikes the question, why are they still filming? Well, this film follows Lance Preston, the charismatic host of Grave Encounters, an infamous ghost investigation TV series, and his crew as they make their way through the abandoned mental asylum Collingwood Psychiatric Hospital. What plays out is a genuinely nerve-wracking classical ghost story. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, there's not much more to the plot other than the pursuit of the paranormal. and the pains that come with it. But as far as that goes, Grave Encounters does it very convincingly and it's jammed with some genuinely uneasy moments. So much so that the Vicious Brothers have extended the Grave Encounters series and developed quite the cult following in the process. Coming in next at number four, Devil's Pass. Now, if you're aware of the Dyatlov Pass incident, then this film will definitely strike a chord as a terrifying adaptation of the notorious unexplained mystery. For those of you not aware with the mystery, the Dyatlov Pass incident was the unsolved death of nine ski hikers in the northern Ural Mountains in 1959 in the then former Soviet Union. To this date, their cause of death is still undetermined, and the strange occurrences surrounding the Dyatlov Pass incidents has been the imaginative spark for dozens of conspiracy theories and paranormal paranormal tales. So as far as a horror movie goes, Devil's Pass draws from some pretty impressive source material. Directed by Rennie Harlan, the man responsible for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Devil's Pass follows the story of five college students who are determined to make a film about the Dyatlov mystery and what plays out is an unnerving interpretation of the events that transpired. To be honest, if you're not a fan of conspiracy theories and government cover-ups, you might feel a bit bogged down with this film, but if you are, then Devil's Pass is a sci-fi horror heart pounding ride through the found footage genre that's smartly made and surprisingly hilarious in parts. Next up at number three, Hell House LLC. What are you looking at? Holy Got me man. <laughs> All right, weirdo. I went into this film with zero expectations and was terrifyingly surprised at how bloody good it was. If you're a fan of The House's October Built, which was featured on our first list, then you'll find all of the same tropes in Hell House, but with more emphasis on the documentary style meta world building that found footage is so well built for. This film kind of went under the radar for most people and was shipped directly to on-demand services. But what's surprising about this film is how well made it is for something that was never in intended to be seen on the big screen. To be honest, Hell House never really strays too 
far from its driving paranormal mystery and we're never fully given an explanation that diverges from the main cast perspective. But that's also why it kind of works. There's no exposition in this film at all and that's the way it should be. And it convincingly captures the feeling of the unknown. By playing out as a slow crawl that gradually unravels in media res, what we get is a genuinely terrifying paranormal mystery that if we suspend our disbelief, could just as well be real. Swinging in at number two, the taking of Deborah Logan. Hey, letting all my heat out. To be honest, this film could get on this list just for one scene in particular, and if you've seen The Taking of Deborah Logan, then you'll know exactly what scene I mean. If you've never seen this film, you've probably already seen the gif of it, because holy moly, that one's messed up. I don't say this lightly, The Taking of Deborah Logan is a really, really good horror flick, irregardless of the fan photo genre. I think then that's part of the reason why it was dismissed, people were tired of the same old, same old, and as soon as they heard the phrase found footage slapped onto it, they didn't give it the chance it deserved. But what they would have found is a convincing display of found footage horror at its best. Directed and co-written by Adam Robitel, The Taking of Deborah Logan follows a documentary crew who are making a research film on patients suffering from Alzheimer's. Their subject is Deborah Logan, an elderly woman with an aggressive form of the disease, but as the crew quickly realises, that prognosis is pretty far from being correct, and there's something much more sinister at work. One of my favourite parts of this film is Gavin, who after finding out that there's ritualistic murders involved, he just straight up quits on the spot and leaves. I love it, and we never see him again, he's just straight up gone, living his best life. Remember guys, if you ever find yourself in a horror movie situation, be more Gavin. And finally, our number one spot, the tunnel. Holy moly, this film is ridiculously good. Equal parts thoroughly entertaining, convincingly made, and just straight up terrifying. Which makes it so much more impressive then that this is essentially a fan made film, crowdfunded by selling individual digital frames for a dollar a piece. Now, I will forgive most criticisms with this film, and to be honest, if you weren't a fan of the Blair Witch Project, then in all likelihood you won't enjoy this. It is very unforgiving with its handheld sequences, there's a lot of disorientating shots, but I don't know about you, that's exactly what I want in found footage horror. I want to feel like I've stumbled upon a tape that shouldn't be seen. It's the reason why I believe found footage horror can be so effective when it's done right. It's not entirely what we see, it's the small moments of chaos that force our imagination to fill in the gaps. On top of that, we have an extra layer of exposition from the documentary sequence, allowing us to witness how the imminent threat ahead has already affected the survivors. What we get is a terrifying display of claustrophobic horror that seriously is edge of your seat stuff. Give this one a watch and then let me know your thoughts in the comment box down below and maybe we'll have enough traction to pull off a part three. Number five on this list is the reversed demon. This demon clearly took some gymnastic classes when they were alive as a person because they're definitely flexing their flexibility muscles now in the demon afterlife. The clips that I'm about to show you were posted to the YouTube channel Kisa Weba. They were captured by a security camera and show a demon slowly crawling across the ground. So as we can see, that demon is just slowly meandering along, minding its own business. Now, you may think that this is the end of the story, but it's actually not, because that thing was caught on another security camera in the area a little bit later. Let's take a look at that. Now what on God's green earth is that freaking thing? I mean, it has to be a demon, right? Like, what the hell? Its face is clearly all white, completely inhuman. And now that we can fully see the way that it walks, we get a clear sense of how demonic it actually is. I think the biggest question that comes up through all of this, though, is what is it doing 
And where's it going? Fingers crossed that whatever it was doing doesn't concern any one of us. Number four on this list is Kubashev Square. Back in 2015, a video was uploaded to YouTube from an account named Demon Operator. The video is only 50 seconds long and shows someone getting chased by a demon or monster in Kubashev Square. Let's roll 30 seconds of that clip and see what you guys think about this demon. So the man gets into the park and just to the left of him is this completely demonic looking spider creature. It's slow out of the gate, but then it starts coming after him. The final 10 seconds of the video is going to show this thing get really close to him and then spit what looks to be some green toxic fluid out at him. Let's roll that now. So, yeah, let's put it this way. Whatever this thing was, it definitely isn't human or any sort of animal that we're aware of. Now, can I say for sure that it's a demon? No, I can't, but I can say that it definitely looks very dangerous. Watch your back, everybody. This thing came after this dude in broad daylight in the park. And finally, number one on this list is the Hallway Demon. This next video was posted back at the end of 2020 and shows somebody getting into a very close encounter with what looks to be a dangerous demon. Yeah, so if that's me, I am getting the hell out of there, folks. I don't care what I think I know about demons or how many freaking boxing classes I've taken in the past, I am not sticking around to see how I'd fare against something like that. Also, let's face it though, the person filming was going through a totally abandoned building that had rumors of a haunting. They pretty much knew what they were getting into with this one. Still though, very scary nonetheless. Number five, Spree. Coming in first on our list is the newest release and a new age classic that I think, give it a few years, will get the recognition, Spree. It was called American Psycho for the digital age and I think that fits. Spree stars Joe Keery of Stranger Things and Joe fame, putting down the baseball bat and the hair gel and sitting behind the wheel of a rideshare service, playing a down on his luck young man named Kurt who wants nothing more than to be a viral famous social media star. Ah. Very relatable. But in a sea of unboxing videos, react TikToks, let's plays, confession videos, hashtag challenges, apologies, and top five videos about horror movies, Kurt struggles to find any sort of audience for his content whatsoever and decides that the best way to stand out on the internet is to live stream himself snuffing his passengers he picks up in his rideshare app. Okay, you know, to each each their own. I'll stick to doing YouTube videos. You do you. Now, Spree is not the smartest movie out there. The social satire is a little basic, to be honest, and it could have done with a lot more fleshing out on its commentary on social media addiction and internet validation, but it makes for a very solid foundation for a flick. It's got a plot that probably would have made for an okay Black Mirror episode, and maybe this movie wouldn't have worked as well if it wasn't for how fun Joe Keery is. Maybe I'm extremely biased because I love the guy, and because like most of the Western world, Steve Harrington is the only reason I watch Stranger Things, but he brings a super fun mania to the social media addicted lunatic. The American Psycho comparison, definitely apt. That's one of my absolute favorite movies of all time for just how sick and like entertainingly evil Patrick Bateman is. You know he's the most reprehensible, unlikable character ever put to film, but Christian Bale is just so damn charismatic you love him. And that's what's happening here. Joe Keery somehow manages to be both convincing as a really scary psychopath, but also oddly sympathetic and earnest. You know, it's the desperate have you ever seen a man soaked head to toe in blood, shaking and quivering after doing something unspeakable and he's still asking you to subscribe
subscribe to his channel. And speaking of vapid, deranged, dead-eyed internet personalities looking for fame, if you're looking for more scary movie reviews, ghosts, goblins, and aliens, well click through to Top 5 Scary and subscribe. We've got loads more content with me behind the wheel, but not really, I, I can't drive. Look at me, I just skate. Number 4, VHS. VHS eventually exploded into a mega hit franchise. I think there's like five or six of them, not even including spin-offs, but it all comes back to the daring original. VHS was a collection of horror movie shorts, all under the same theme of bizarre found footage horror, and the result is electric. It's like getting to sit at home for your own private horror movie film festival. Now, the collections of shorts featured were all directed by, at the time, fairly underground independent horror movie directors, but now looking back at it, it's like they've assembled a really impressive pantheon of rising horror legend. We got stuff from Adder Wingard, who gave us Year Next in the 2016 Blair Witch reboot, which was okay. We got one from David Bruckner, who would go on to direct The Ritual in the 2022 Hellraiser. And we've got T.I. West, who would make the A24 Darling Pearl. So it's a film with nothing but wall-to-wall -wall talent and creativity at their best. It also made the format of being an anthology movie like part of the plot of the movie itself, which I thought was very meta and juicy. A group of career crooks filmed themselves committing violent and vile acts, and hey, I wonder if they knew the guy from the first movie. Movie, and they are commissioned to heist a single object, a mysterious VHS tape. The guys break into the house and find the tape, and the movie is them watching it and then cutting back to whatever strange mystery is happening with the criminals. It's very inventive, it's very immersive, it's very, very cool. Now, all the segments are really cool, but I want to shout out the shorts Tuesday the 17th for being a very high concept idea for a horror movie. I can't say I've seen elsewhere, and I can't even say too much about giving it away, but it uses the VHS format really fun. And another shout out for something strange happened to Emily when she was younger. A Again, very inventive. It's told exclusively through video calls and the internet, and it features a hearty dose of medical body horror, wild twists, and just like like the tiniest little bit of alien stuff. Just like a little bit. Number three, Lake Mungo. Okay, let's go back to another lesser known one with Lake Mungo. This one's an Australian feature, came out around 2008. Lake Mungo is a healthy, hearty dose of scares and thrills and heart-wrenching family drama. Horror and family drama go hand in hand like the girl from Hereditary and a stop sign. Too soon? That was too far? That was too far? That was too far. In Lake Mungo, we're in the perspective of Matthew Palmer, a young man who has been depressed and broken shortly after his sister's drowning shattered his family's well-being and mental health. However, Matthew begins to see signs of his sister everywhere, feeling her presence in the house with him, and mostly because he keeps seeing her ghost all around. He sets up a surveillance camera system all over their house and begins making a documentary about his experience hunting for his sister and closure. As the investigation as to whether or not his sister really is haunting them, Matthew ends up uncovering family secrets that were long thought buried and finds himself haunted by his sister's loss in a way much grander than any ghost story could. Now what I really like about this one is pretty much right up until credits, you'll be asking yourself what's happening. Not in a confusing way, like an inception sort of thing, it's just got a bunch of fun and clever twists that kind of keep you guessing the entire film, keep you asking questions. The film uses the medium well, it allows the audience to go on this journey with the family, where you're there with them, and you're asking too what's happening if it's really a haunt or if it's all just a sad family wanting to see their daughter one last time. It honestly ends up being really heartwarming in a bizarre way. You don't see a lot of horror movies that kind of get you right here. And without spoiling like too, too much, because I do want you to see it, unlike Hereditary, this one doesn't really have like a happy ending, but it doesn't have a horrifically sad ending. It's kind of bittersweet. It's genuinely very touching. So if you're looking for something to tug at your heartstrings a lot while also making your hair stand on end, you can't go wrong with Lake Munga. Number two is Wreck. Maybe you've already seen this one because it was a smash hit commercially and critically, but if you haven't, man, come on, you really ought to. Wreck is found footage stuff at its best, putting you smack dab in the POV of the action, and it makes you feel like you're both part of this horrifying nightmare, but also kind of like you're like an FBI agent watching evidence recovered years after the fact in a dark room. Wreck follows a film crew that's recording something when they find themselves caught in a way bigger story. When a neighbor attacks someone and bites them, police quarantine off a building for an unknown reason, and you get to experience it all go down in first person as more and more people inside the building seem to be turning into something a little rabid, vicious, and more than a little undead. Wreck does zombies 28 days later style with a pretty interesting twist that I, I won't give away if you still haven't seen it.
mean, it, they're fast, violent, and unpredictable, and it makes for a super entertaining movie watching the protagonists try and fend off a horde of undead in these really cramped, tight, claustrophobic spaces. There's a lot of excellent choreography work going on here to make sure everything fits in the frame, and the first person view of the camera really makes it feel like you are stuck in there with them too. If you let yourself get into it, you really have a good time with this one. Like, if there was ever really a zombie apocalypse happening, I think we could all agree there'd be gigabytes worth of cell phone footage to go through. So in a bizarre way, this movie about a zombie apocalypse feels oddly realistic. Even just outside of being a good found footage horror movie, Wreck is also just a super good zombie movie if you're into that sort of thing. They remade it into Quarantine for Americans a year later, but if you want my advice, skip the remake and just go for the original, and that is honestly true of like 99.9% .9 of all horror movies anyway. Okay, before we get into number one properly, I wanted to cheat a little bit and break the rules of top five. Don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody that I added some extras, but I wanted to shout out a few honorable mentions that I love that didn't make the cut. Blair Witch is gonna be the first one. The original, the sequels are all iffy. Number two is gonna be Troll Hunters. Really, 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 really fun monsters. Yeah. Paranormal Activity, it's pretty good. It's not super my thing, but it's pretty good. And finally, wanted to shout out Host really quick. It's about a seance that happens on Zoom. Just came out, very modern. Okay, there we go. So number one on the list is gonna be Creep. It's got nothing to do with Radiohead, sorry. Coming to us from Patrick Bryce and indie darling Mark Duplass, he takes a break from earnestly mumbling through an indie movie to play a completely chilling, well, the title said it, Creep. This movie is basically just watching Mark Duplass be really, really, really weird in front of a camera for an hour and 20 minutes. It's a great example of when you can do a lot more with a lot less. This movie is as absolutely bare bones as it gets. There's two actors in the entire movie and they're the two guys who wrote and directed the movie. A struggling videographer, Aaron, gets an offer to film a series of personal diaries for a strange client, Joseph, who has an inoperable brain tumor and wants to leave a series of videos behind for his unborn child. Which does sound nice until Aaron gets there and discovers very quickly something is really off about this and this isn't gonna be a normal job. This movie is all performance and Duplass crushes it as the bizarre, mysterious Joseph. He plays him really, like, realistically creepy. Like, he's the kind of guy you'd meet on a bus and spend the rest of the day thinking about. Like, you know something is wrong with the guy, but you're not really sure in what way and just how afraid of him and how dangerous he might be until it's too late. It's a movie that really gets in your head and gets right under your skin. If you leave the movie terrified of the main character, but also very enamored in equal measures, worry not, because Bryce and Duplass agree with you, since there's a creep too, which is apparently just as good as the first. I I haven't seen it yet, you know, I only have so much time, but I should, should see it eventually, since there is a Creep 3 in early pre-production stages. So although this guy may be a completely unsettling weirdo, we love this creep and can't get enough. He belongs here. Number five, The Blair Witch Project. I remember seeing this when I was like 10, and I'm not gonna lie, it kind of scared the shit out of me. It still does. It tripped me out, because like back then my parents were like, oh don't worry honey, this is made up, after like every scary movie we watched. But this time they were like, was that real? You know, my dad just sat there quiet thinking. I, I, I was scared. Because the whole production apparently did such an amazing job from top to tail of its release, making the audience still feel like it really happened. The Blair Witch Project is probably the most famous found footage movie ever made. The campaign tactic was that the viewers were told through missing persons posters and that the characters were missing while researching in the woods for this mythical Blair Witch. Their IMDb page even listed the actors as missing and presumed deceased in the first year of the film's release. Even the film's website contained actors posing as investigators giving testimonies about their evidence. They even shared childhood photos of the three leads to add a sense of realism. By August 1999, the website had received 160 million hits and the movie went from a flop at midnight to the top worldwide. During screenings, the filmmakers made advertising efforts to promote the events in the film as factual, including the distribution of flyers at all of the film festivals such as Sundance and Cannes, asking viewers to come forward with any information about the missing students. All the actors making their feature film debuts as well were described as missing and presumed dead. The actor's parents even started receiving condolence calls and sympathy letters. The actors got to witness the movie blow up but they weren't even invited to the screenings due to the publicity. Imagine not being able to go see your own premiere, or even really celebrate your huge role in this huge successful movie. It's kind of sad for the actors, don't you think? I think it is. Number four, The Bay. Of course, if you like what we do here on Top 5 Scary, throw us a thumbs up down below or comment which one of these real-ish movies scared you the most. The Bay is a 2012 American mockumentary horror film directed by Barry Levinson and written by Michael Wallach. 
The movie's basically about a small town getting infected with a contaminated water source that two oceanographers discovered in the bay without saying anything. After investigating fish being eaten from the inside out, they realize that the culprit is this tongue-eating louse creature that looks like the bugs from like Starship Troopers. Yeah, really scary. The movie came out as a result of a documentary Levinson was asked to produce about real problems facing the Chesapeake Bay. Although Levinson chose to abandon the documentary upon learning that it was already being covered by a huge news network organization. Levinson instead decided to use all that research to produce this horror film, which he hoped would shed light on the issues facing Chesapeake Bay. As such, when promoting the film, he noted that more than 80% of the film is real and actually factual information. Also, 80% is so real that it had to wait to be released and cleared first. Uh, what? Yeah, this was like a real issue, hence the confusion around the found footage. Apparently this nuclear disaster monster giant isopod in the bay aren't real, but the small isopods filmed are very real. You see a tight shot of the isopod, Levinson said. That's not CGI, that's real. We just pulled that out of the Atlantic Ocean. The isopods do this really gruesome thing, which the bay does a great example of, is that they eat the fish from inside out. All that stuff is actually factual. A leaking nuclear reactor actually does have a runoff heading towards the Chesapeake Bay. Its quantities aren't great, but the fact that it's actually happening seems scary enough. The chicken farm runoff stuff is actually factual too. At the end of the day, yes, it's a movie, not a documentary, but it's infused with a lot of things that are really real. I think it adds to the nature of the piece, end quote. Hey, spoken like a true artist. And that's why the film has gotten so many great reviews. Give it a watch, very spooky, very well done. Number three, the Poughkeepsie Tapes. Writer-director fam jam duo John Eric and Drew Dowdle are best known for their sinister yet impeccable found footage movies. Yeah, it's pretty gory and actually had to wait 10 years before being released due to the graphic footage on it. It's rumored that it was held for 10 years due to its contents and disturbing atmosphere, referring to it as a banned movie. It's likely that MGM felt audiences weren't really ready to see such graphic contents. In an abandoned house in Poughkeepsie, New York, murder investigators uncover hundreds of tapes showing decades of a deranged killer's work. And in an all too realistic found footage mockumentary, the moments showing the killer POV are things of nightmares. I'm not gonna lie, this is like the goriest movie on our list today. But with scary movies, sometimes comes a little gore, you know? The Poughkeepsie Tapes plays out as a faux documentary following the discovery of a very large collection of VHS tapes created by said deranged psychopath and the investigations that follow. The documentary is well shot and played out in a believable manner. Sometimes the acting is a little, yeah, this is really fake. And then sometimes it's like, Okay, I'm gonna look up if that guy's a real cop. The feel of this movie is gore, gore, gore. If you're into like Saw type stuff and multiple victims and lots of popcorn syrup, this one's definitely for you. These tapes are only fictional, but there's a small catch. According to Marist College, the Poughkeepsie tapes may be based on an actual event. A killer named Kendall Francois killed eight to 10 people in Poughkeepsie in the late 90s, but didn't videotape the murders. There's heavy debate in the film industry on which movies are depicting actual cases similar to actual reports and acts that are totally staged and made up. Number two, The Quiet Ones. The Quiet Ones is a 2014 British supernatural horror film directed by John Pogue based on a very real 1972 parapsychology experience called The Philip Experiment conducted in Toronto. It stars Jared Harris as a UFT professor attempting to prove that poltergeists are actually real manifestations of the human psyche and not actually supernatural beings. The movie is very scary, no doubt about it. Jared Harris is amazing, as always, but the real story behind it is actually way more terrifying. The professors of mathematics, science, and psychology created a fictitious character through an attempt to communicate with said fictitious entity through a controlled seance. It was the real deal. The character created and agreed upon was named Philip during the test. His fictional backstory coincided with real historic events and places, but with multiple contradictions and errors. They said he was born in 1624 in England, had an early military career, knighted by 16, in the English Civil War, and eventually dying at the age of 30. The group was seated around a table via a lecture with initial seances yielding no contact, no communication, and no phenomenon. The professors then dimmed the lights, fully leaned into the seance, changing the environment. 
Participants and students then began feeling a presence. Lots of table vibrations, breezes, unexplained voices, and sounds which matched responses to Philip's life. Audio and video and witness accounts documented the paranormal event, but Philip never actually appeared. Yo, this actually happened, like, like down the street from us. This is terrifying. And number one, Ghost Watch 1992. First broadcast on BBC One Halloween Night 1992. Written by Stephen Volk and directed by Leslie Manning, the drama was produced for an actual BBC anthology series. Despite having been recorded only weeks in advance, the narrative was presented as a live television broadcast. During and following its first and only UK television broadcast, the show resulted in an estimated 1 million separate phone calls to the BBC that night, dealing with a mixture of complaints and praise for the program's bizarre release. Yeah, Ghostwatch has never been repeated on UK television. It's been replayed on stations such as the Canadian channel Scream for Halloween once in 2004, and the Belgian channel Canvas in 2008. The hour and a half event was shot documentary style and appeared as part of the BBC. It involved actual BBC reporters performing a live on-air investigation of a so-called haunted house in London in which demonic poltergeists activity was taking place. Through found footage and interviews with family living there, they discovered the existence of a violent ghost nicknamed Pipes. A nickname from their kids. Footage actually showed the police arriving at Fox Hill Drive and the spirit even dragged a BBC host behind a door. Yeah, that is horrifying. Imagine watching your weekly hosts on like a reliable television network that's censored and archived and then all of a sudden the host just gets yanked up the wall by a supposed demon live on TV. Number five on this list is the alien baby. This is a clip of what looks like an alien child. We know how the government is with aliens and anything extraterrestrial, so it's clear why they wouldn't want the public looking at something like this too closely. I mean, they don't let anyone in on anything happening in any of their secret bases, so it makes sense they wouldn't want us watching a video like something like this. Let's show 30 seconds of this clip and you guys comment down below what the heck this thing is. Now, how are you feeling? Down. Are you feeling okay? You feel well? Can I get you something? You want a glass of water? We're not really getting anywhere, are we, at the moment? Are you seeing something? Is there something you see over there? So, very clearly, that is not a human child. Now, it's possible that could be an animal of some kind, but I have no idea what type of animal looks like that. That's why, if I had to guess, we're looking at some type of alien creature. This is a really interesting find because it means that aliens might have children, similar to how we have children. Obviously, we don't know the process to how this baby came about, but the idea that aliens Aliens grow like we grow. That's important information because for a long time people have speculated on their reproductive process. To just assume that they grow like we grow would be ignorant on our part, but now this looks like some serious evidence. What I want to see though is a clip of this creature several years from now. What does this thing look like then? It doesn't look too threatening today, but you already know that it's gonna turn into something deadly, most likely. Number four on this list is the dinosaurs. This next clip was initially from Shortest Blockbusters, but was broken down by Chills on his channel. I'm gonna play you an excerpt of what he has to say right now. Do you believe that some extraterrestrials are living among us? Then you really gotta see this scary video. The footage shows two dinosaur-looking creatures scurrying across a frozen river. They have spines that are heightened, long tails, and pointed heads. Otherwise, their bodies look more or less human human. Are these dinosaurs, extraterrestrials, humanoids? And that is the big question, right guys? Aliens, dinosaurs, or humanoids? What the heck are they? He goes on in that video to talk about how he believed this was actually VFX, but some people in the comments weren't too sure. 
VFX could easily be the explanation, but it could also be used as an excuse. The government has chalked a lot of things up to VFX and CGI before, and some of that has turned out to be real, so why can't this? Aliens living among us, or other creatures living among us, has been talked about and rumored for a long time. We have had no definitive proof, but videos like this just keep getting released with no explanation. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years time, some real proof finally surfaced Surfaces confirming a lot of our suspicions about these creatures. Number three on this list is the river creature. This next video was released back in 2015 and shows a bunch of people wearing hazmat suits picking a strange looking creature out of a river. This was apparently captured in Poland and there was no official report on this when it came out. So as we can see, there is a bunch of people with hazmat suits picking up this weird creature from the river. What is that creature and why do they need to be wearing these hazmat suits for? So they handed off to some other people in different colored hazmat suits and then walked to a place where presumably the person filming can't go. I also wouldn't be surprised if the person filming was already in a spot where they weren't allowed to be and just snuck in anyways. Maybe this is in some secret base of some kind where experiments are being performed. I mean why else would they need hazmat suits? Definitely a very strange one there guys. Comment down below if you have any idea what they were doing here and what that thing was. Number two on this list is the creepy mermaid. So I always thought that I would want to meet a mermaid, but if this is what they look like, then I definitely don't have any interest in that anymore. We're gonna see a clip from a video here that was posted back in 2018. It looks to be of a docking area somewhere and has an incredibly scary creature lying across the dock. So what the hell was that thing, guys? That is one messed up creature that is hanging around there. Maybe it got scared off by the camera and decided that it wanted to head back in the water after it spotted the person filming it. It had a tail kind of like a mermaid, but at the same time, there wasn't really anything human about this thing, so maybe it isn't connected to that at all. But if it isn't a mer person, then what sort of creature could this thing be and why haven't we heard more about it? You have to imagine that if creatures like this are swimming around our waters, that the government, they'd be aware of this, but they haven't said anything about it at all. Who knows how many creepy things are in our oceans that we don't know about. And number one on this list is the creepy creature. The video that I'm going to show you was uploaded by Keenan Music to YouTube on May 7th, 2021. It's a very short clip, only 15 seconds long, of someone investigating Japan using Google Earth and discovering something super creepy and weird. An unexplained object is going to be flying in the sky over top of a Japanese city. Let's roll the clip now. That thing almost looks like a drone, but it also looks like it could be made from organic material. I also don't know of any drones that look like that that are constructed by humans. Could this be something from another planet that made its way to Earth undetected and is scoping out our world? I think everything is on the table with something like this and some investigation desperately needs to get done. Comment down below what you think this could be and why nothing official has been released on it yet. In our fifth place position, we have my favorite creepy doll, Annabelle. Back when I was in high school, I actually got to portray her in a local haunted house, which was the beginning of my scare acting career. Hey, I promise I am quite terrifying if I want to be. I promise. For those of you who might be rolling their eyes right now, I'm going to refresh memories on the real Annabelle story. 
so feel free to cozy up and listen. Donna and Angie were student nurses and good friends who had decided to room together while in school. And for Donna's 28th birthday, her mom had gifted her a very large Raggedy Ann doll, something she was thrilled about. Personally, I'd react the same way. Let the record know that I'm always down to accept gifts of dolls or plushies. Soon after adopting the precious doll, Donna started to notice some weird behavior. She would leave Annabelle in her bed every morning behind her locked bedroom door, seating her the same way with her arms and legs crossed, and would come home at night to Annabelle having moved rooms and in positions that weren't possible. She's described a few instances of the doll kneeling, and speaking from experience, stuffed dolls can't kneel without falling for more than a few seconds. Donna and Angie then started finding notes left throughout the apartment, written on parchment paper in red pen, two things they didn't own. When Donna's boyfriend Lou started criticizing the doll, unexplainable handprints and scratches began appearing on his body. And that's when the girls made the decision to call a priest, who then brought in the Warrens. They were able to calm down the entity enough to remove it from the home and transport her to their museum, where she resides to this day. Now, the footage I'm talking about here is from the visitors who have visited Annabelle in her current residence over the years. If you look closely, you can just see the energy that's alive in her. Also, if she was never removed from her box until like the last two years, how is she able to change position? Position ever so slightly from one video to the next. You tell me here. In fourth place, we have footage from a Buddhist exorcism. Known as Parita, which can be translated as protection or safeguard, it refers to the Buddhist practice of reciting certain verses and scriptures in order to ward off misfortune or danger. The practice of reciting or listening to the Parita suttas began very early in the history of Buddhism. The Mahavamsa contains the earliest historical reference to this practice, describing how Upatisa I instructed monks to recite the Ratana Sutta throughout the night during a period when Sri Lanka was afflicted by plague and diseases. In the Pali literature, these short verses are recommended by the Buddha as providing protection from certain afflictions. The belief in the effective power to heal, or protect, of the Sakakariya, or asseveration of something quite true, is an aspect of the work ascribed to the Parita. It is also widely believed that all-night recitations of Parita by monks bring safety, peace, and well-being to a community. Parita discourses can be recited at events like a funeral or on the death anniversary of a loved one, and can also be recited to placate antagonistic spirits. In 1987, Ed and Lorraine took a trip to Japan to offer their expertise in some cases that were ongoing in different parts of the country, with one of their stops being to a Buddhist temple. Describing everyone they encountered as lovely, Ed and Lorraine were shocked when they came upon not one, but two people under possession. Ed described one as being under the influence of a snake demon, as they slithered around the floor constantly, with their tongue darting in and out of their mouth. The possessed people were blindfolded, so the demons couldn't witness the rites, as the Buddhas went through the rituals and chanted around them. After the spirits were cast out, a bonfire was built to help guide them towards the afterlife. The footage we see is from a later round of prayers, which was held because one of the sets of spirits refused initially to depart from her attached soul. You can hear Lorraine attempting to guide the spirit out with the aid of a translator, coaxing Teresa to go on to the light and fly away that her family was no longer here. In third place, we have the elusive white lady of Union Graveyard. Some believe she is Harriet Seeley, whose young son passed shortly after being born, and Harriet herself passing soon afterwards. Legend believes she may have died in hopes of finding her son, and still wanders their final resting place searching him out. While others believe she is the ghost of a woman from the 1940s, who killed her husband and later herself, and is doomed to wander the graveyard. You tell me which one you believe. Her physical description is the one thing that remains consistent. She is a young woman wearing a white dress with dark hair. Thank goodness I'm not wearing white today. It seems as if she enjoys scaring the daylights out of the living, which hey, my kind of gal. Many who have witnessed her believe they have almost hit her with their vehicle, only to find no trace of her once they pull over, while others claim they have often seen her hovering slightly above the ground around the cemetery, going back and forth amongst different gravestones. In 1993, local firefighter Glenn Powell received a call about a transformer explosion and drove to the scene of the incident with a police officer, and observed a female driver following closely behind him on the road. He remembers the night sky had turned pink, my favorite color, and the explosion emitted large amounts of electricity that had made the hair on his arm stand up at a close distance. Glenn was driving along the road beside the cemetery when the officer seated next to him yelled, Watch out! In the middle of the road was a woman with you guessed it, long brown flowing hair and wearing a white Victorian nightgown. Glenn described seeing a surprised look on her face before slamming on the brakes, but was unable to avoid hitting her, describing it like hitting a brick wall, with the back of his truck flying into the air, and the policeman next to him being launched into the dashboard. The driver behind him jumped out of the car and helped the two men search the area of the crash to check on the woman. Glenn is quoted as saying, there was no red bodily fluids, there was no clothing, there was nobody, there was nothing. Located in Connecticut, Lorraine used to often take walks through the cemetery, saying that it was one of the most haunted places around. 
Ed caught the white lady on camera on September 1st, 1990 at 2.40 a.m., his seventh night in a row of filming at the cemetery. Determined to have footage as proof, and we can show some of that footage to you now. He described dark figures surrounding her, shapes that he said were wood ghosts that seemed to jump on her while they all argued. In second place, we have the Amityville Horror. On November 13th of 1974, Ronald DeFeo Sr., his wife, and four of their offspring, Don, Allison, Mark, and John had their lives ended by a firearm inside their home in suburban Amityville, New York. And at the time, homicide detectives claimed it was the largest number of victims in a single slang on Long Island. The deceased were found in their nightclothes and were shot in the back, apparently while they were asleep. There were no signs of a struggle inside the home, where a sign hanging outside the main entrance read, High Hopes, Sure. The killings were reported by the only surviving member of the family, the oldest son. Ronald. He told the police that he arrived at the home shortly after 6 p.m. but found the front door locked. So he crawled into the house through a window and stumbled across the icky scene. He later confessed that he had ended the lives of his family around 3.30 a.m., acting out the scenes for detectives as he described how he took out his family one by one, with the weapon eventually being found in Amityville Creek. Ronald's trial began in October of 1975. His defense attorney, William Weber, tried to make a case that the defendant, who allegedly heard voices, was innocent by reason of insanity, but the court eventually sentenced him to six current 25 year to life sentences. Try saying that five times fast. Eesh. A year later, the Lutz family moved into the now abandoned home, and that's where this goes from simply tragic to much, much more. Most of the DeFeo family's furniture was still in the house because it was included for $400 as part of the deal. Eh, you know what, I'd take that deal too. A friend of George Lutz, the father of the family, had learned about the history of the house and insisted on having it blessed. And at the time, George was a non-practicing Methodist and had no experience of what this would entail. Kathy, the mom, was a non-practicing Catholic and explained the process to him. George knew a Catholic priest named Father Mancuso who agreed to carry out the house blessing. He arrived to perform the blessing while George and Kathy were unpacking their belongings on the afternoon of December 18th, 1975, and went into the home to carry out the rites. When he flicked the first amount of holy water and began to pray, he heard a masculine voice demand that he get out. When leaving the house, the priest did not mention this incident to either George or Kathy until December 24th, when he called George and advised him to stay out of the second floor room where he had heard the mysterious voice, which happened to be the former bedroom of Mark and John DeFeo that Kathy had planned to use as a sewing room, but the call was cut short by static. Following his visit to the house, the father allegedly developed a high fever and blisters on his hands, similar to stigmata. At first, George and Kathy experienced nothing unusual in the house, but the horrors that happened over the next 28 days were awful for the Lutz family, bearing witness to slime pouring out of their walls, strange odors throughout the home, and George would wake up at 3.15 every morning, which is right around the time Ron DeFeo carried out his original crimes. A garage door would open and close on its own, an invisible spirit knocked a knife down in the kitchen, a pig-like creature with red eyes was reported staring at George and his son Daniel through a window, also Kathy and two of her children experienced bouts of levitation while trying to sleep. The footage we have from this heinous month is of a boy with glowing eyes, believed to be the spirit of the late John DeFeo. By mid-January of 1976, after another attempt at a house blessing by George and Kathy, they experienced what would be their final night in the house. Now, the Lutzes were never able to give a full account of the events that took place on this occasion, describing them as too frightening. After getting in touch with Father Mancuso, the Lutzes decided to take some belongings and stay at Kathy's mother's house in nearby Deer Park, New York, until they had sorted out the problems with the house. They claimed the phenomena followed them there, describing greenish-black slime coming up the staircase towards them. Yeah, no thanks. And finally, in first place, we have footage of an American exorcism. While the video is blurred out on YouTube to protect the identity of the poor girl, I personally think it's up there as one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. At an hour and 20 minutes long, it depicts a Catholic bishop in Connecticut attempting to converse with a demonic entity that has possessed the body of an innocent young woman, while her family restrains her. Ed and Lorraine were the ones to alert the church to the possession after meeting her during an audience chat session that was held at the conclusion of one of their public presentations. During portions of the exorcism, when prayer is done, you can hear the demon acting wildly, and it originally refuses to give its name, both of which are quite common in cases of demonic possession. Eventually, we learn that there are four demons possessing our victim, with one of them identifying themselves as Robert, which happens to be a name associated with the son of Satan. I'll let a snippet roll now, allowing you to hear the woman for yourself. Number five, the Kane Parsons shorts. Now, if you're a fan of internet horror like uh, Slender Man, Marble Hornets, or the SCP Foundation, you know, all that sort of stuff, then no doubt you're probably already well versed in the backrooms and all the horror those odorous 70s hallways emanate 
but I know my mom watches my videos sometimes, so I thought I'd start off with a quick summary and a flash of the most famous backrooms content before we really get into it. Initially starting life as a small post on a certain image board, you know the one, in 2019, backrooms refers to a space between realities that manifests as a dreary, never-ending stretch of abandoned office building hallways, a sea of stained yellow wallpaper and terrible carpets. What started as one small post really quickly developed into a fandom with everybody writing their own backstories, continuity, lore, and all these narratives coming together in a big cosmic gumbo in this setting of the fractal hallways that live between worlds. One of the most famous, and I would argue what kind of propelled the backrooms from underground horror community stuff to mainstream, was a series of short films by a very young YouTuber named Kane Parsons. Parsons kickstarted the trend of making backrooms found footage videos, which is what we're looking at today, and pretty much everything we're going to be looking at was inspired by what he worked on. It's fantastic stuff, honestly. Triply so when you learn that he was 16 years old when he made it. If you haven't seen any of them yet, I definitely say go check them out after this video. They're a great little bit of shoestring budget internet horror. The original video is probably the best little like microcosm of it. There's a bunch and bunch of them, but they're all well made. And if you really liked it and you think, hey, I'd enjoy that concept for roughly 90 minutes, I hope I can sit in a big room with 300 other people and eat some popcorn and do that. I got some fantastic news for you. A24 Productions is working on a feature length script about the backrooms. It's going to be directed by Parsons with collaboration from James Wan, who if you don't recognize the name was the director of Saw and the Conjuring. Time will tell if that movie will be a total hit or a flop, but nonetheless I think it's incredibly cool that an independent filmmaker is gonna get to make a big horror movie before he can even legally rent a car. That's like so cool. And if you want more internet horror, you are in exactly the right place for it. Because you can click through on our channel and see the hundreds upon hundreds of scary videos we've been making for years. Put together some words that you like, you'll find something for it, I guarantee you. Stay subscribed, stay scared, and stay watching this video, okay? We got more backrooms coming up for you. Number four, no clipping through reality. Now, in that very first post that described the backrooms and created the, the initial lore, it said that the way you get to the backrooms is by no clipping through reality. If you spent most of your childhood outside playing sports with other kids and you weren't exclusively surfing the Steam forums, maybe the term no clip is unfamiliar with you. It's a video game development term, meaning no collisions, allowing you to pass through all objects in a digital space. It's mostly used for development, but it can also be a little cheat code in some games. I had a lot of fun no clipping through Half-Life 2 and feeling like I was some sort of temporal god just like blitzing through all the levels in six seconds. The idea of no clipping in reality sounds kind of funny, but also if you like really thought about it, just terrifying. I mean, imagine if you woke up one day and physics just stopped working entirely. It would probably stress me out. You don't have to imagine much more, because thanks to a Redditor and TikToker by the handle of Active Hypocrite, we have a look at just what phasing through reality might look like. And, and here's where it would go. Starts kind of funny, the chair scrambling around like a source engine prop glitching out, and then not even 10 seconds later, our hapless protagonist finds themselves no clipping through reality, and landing flat in the back rooms, presumably to spend out the rest of their days. Imagine how scary that would be. Your whole life's just upturned and half a second like that, you're enjoying reality reality, enjoying all the pleasures that existence has to offer, and then BAM! To the back rooms with ya. I gotta say, people give TikTok a lot of guff, and rightfully so. I've seen a lot of terrible things on there. But I do like how it's become a video platform for really quick, like, bite-sized little snacks of filmmaking. Any platform that allows creative people a medium for which to serve up scares, A-okay with me. Number three, the entrance to the back rooms on Google Earth. It's a popular trend on TikTok lately where users claim that they're able to find doorways into the infamous back rooms, finding the portals that connect the realities between and that they can find these points on Google Earth. I've watched a bunch of them, some of them, I'm not gonna lie, pretty corny, but some of them are pretty fun, like the one I've found for you here. Posted to us from user Super Game Kid, and I, I, I have to throw this out here. The video in question, when it was posted, it was posted with the title, Not Fake. So if you had any doubts, well there it is, Not Fake. Duh. Not like anyone can attach photos to Google Earth or anything, no sir. Alright, we'll roll some of this clip in question. Now remember, this user found something strange in Japan. A big, mysterious looking complex. Maybe a high-tech government institution. Something that wouldn't look too out of place in an SCP story or something. That's already odd enough, because I don't know what this building really is. When you zoom in on it like they did, you get an up-close and personal view of everybody's favorite, never-ending, liminal series of hallways, the back rooms. I like to think that if the back rooms are 
out there, you know, in between realities. This endlessly expanding space of musty hallways. The way to access it was through the most advanced high-tech facility. Billions of dollars spent to get trapped in a mysterious stinky space. Isn't that mostly the plot of Stranger Things? Who knows what sort of research could be done on the back rooms? Who knows what sort of efforts have been made to reach them? You just try typing SV no clip zero. That's a little joke for uh, gamers out there. All I know is that it's not anything I'm looking to explore anytime soon, so I'm thankful for videos like this where I can experience the back rooms from the comfort of my own reality with doorways and exits and an outside and everything. Number two, death rooms. I think we've been getting a little tame with these videos. And I mean, that's sort of the nature of the back rooms, isn't it? It's more about the strange wistfulness that comes from a place that's familiar, nostalgic, but unrecognizable, like a dream being described to you by someone else. Bit of an esoteric fear. But esoteric fear doesn't really make for good videos YouTubers can make stupid thumbnails and the faces reacting to about. So sometimes we gotta crank it up just a little bit while also meeting content guidelines. Much like the SCP Foundation, there's all sorts of contributors to the shared urban urban legend that is the back rooms. Some of them see the back rooms as a lot more hostile. Let's roll some of this recovered found footage from YouTuber ChuggaYT called The Death Walls. Whatever is going on in this clip is bad news bears and then some. We see it from the perspective of a couple of explorers donning hazmat suits, presumably from some super secret government institution you need black ops level clearance to even know about. Maybe the SCP Foundation? I could definitely see those guys getting involved in something like this. Whatever has happened though is absolutely horrible. We see the remnants of the investigation crew squished up against the walls. They had no clips set back to one, not zero. They're wedged in between the back rooms. Their insides are sprayed all over horrifically. But that might not even be the worst thing happening out there because whoever we're watching the footage of is running from something horrifying that we can't see. Now there's a lot of low effort content about the back rooms, all the 3 a.m. posts, all the silly reaction faces. There's some very cool independent filmmaking and creative work being done with the back rooms, and I always want to shout out a more creative one when I see it. It's only a minute long, and it gave me a little spook. So toss Chugga YT a like when you see him next, and tell him the top five scary gangs sent you. Number one, the pool rooms. Now, since the back rooms first started becoming popular around like 2019-ish, there are so many clips and videos of people recording their own experiences and everyone's got their own little like personal touch on what they think the back rooms is. And really it's a shared internet horror story, so nobody's got a wrong answer. There's a lot of really great ones worth checking out, but I think some of them don't quite get what was making it so scary or, or unique in the first place. If it's just monsters and bad guys and scary writings on the walls, that's like any other horror setting. When the original post was just about a bizarre office space that looked familiar but off in a way that you can't really place. This video posted to Reddit called The Pool Rooms really captures that for me. It's an endless, sprawling, familiar location. It doesn't really look like anything out of reality. It looks almost like it could be like an abandoned shopping mall from the 80s or something. You know, that ceramic style, that trademark soulless architecture and design. You can tell where like a food court Taco Bell should be. Except it's all been mostly flooded up to about shin level. It's enough to be annoying, but not enough to be impossible to travel through. There is really something about this, for me at least. The stillness when something should be there. Something will leap out at you but never comes. Look at it for a long time and just think about how unpleasant it would be to be in there. Cold, lonely, constantly wet, no reprieval or even a moment to catch your breath and get dry. The back rooms and the whole concept of it is, is scariest when I think it's like a, a dream that you're only sort of half remembering. You're not sure what's real and what isn't. Everything in this video has been real though, I'll tell you that. I would never tell you something fake on this channel. I love the pool rooms, I love the aesthetic of it. The Redditor who posted it, one Jared Pike, does a lot of cool art very much in this style of like scary liminal spaces on his personal Instagram. So if you were like me and you were enamored by the haunting beauty of this clip. Give the guy a follow because it ain't easy for a struggling artist out there. Not like, not like I would know anything about that. 